Tell us about the microbiome. That's a particular area of interest to you, specifically two studies, the RAMP study and the five fee fo study. Um, what did you What did you get from that that might help our audience change some of their own habits? So the Sonnenbergs and I have now done multiple studies, and some of them have been with supplements. One was a fiber supplement, and one was a fermented uh, probiotic supplement, and they didn't have any strong main effects. In both of those, they have a fabulous lab team that's looking at all kinds of subcategories, and they always come up with something interesting, Alexander, but hard to explain to an audience. Our best, most practical study was called FIFIFO, FI for fermented, and FI for fiber, and FO for food. So that's FIFIFO. Uh, that was Justin's idea. I thought it was very clever. <laughs> so they got we got one group to try to double their fiber intake. And we got another group to try to eat up to six servings a day of fermented food. And so I'm going to bet some of your viewers, listeners will roll their eyes and say, oh, great, eating fermented food all day. What a stupid study. So it turns out we wanted them to eat uh, yogurt or kombucha or drink kombucha, eat sauerkraut, eat uh, kimchi, or also kefir. Those are the five main ones that we had at the time. And if you, if you realize that some of those servings are quite small, the kombucha that you buy in a store is two servings, uh, like six ounces of yogurt is a serving, half a cup of kimchi, a half a cup of sauerkraut is a serving without many calories. We actually put together a whole bunch of different patterns of six servings and the average caloric content of six servings is 300 calories. Mm. Mm And so six servings a day sounds like a huge lift. And it turned out it wasn't. For somebody who's eating two or 3,000 calories a day, that's actually quite a small percentage. So those folks, there were 18 of them, diversified their microbiome, which is cool. We like diversity. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were curious. We assumed, oh, well, we're giving them fermented food that has live microbes in it. So that's what they're getting. The Sonnenberg Lab characterized all the microbes by buying all the things that the participants were buying. And they found that the majority of microbes that were adding to the diversity were not from the probiotic foods. So this is a very illuminating, like, oh my God, what's happening here? Wow. Do, 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 And it, you know, their explanation for now is that there's a lot of microbes in our intestinal tract that need an opportunity to bloom and thrive. And so by changing up the environment of your gut, you may actually liberate something that was there in such a small quantity, you couldn't even see it before. And now that you've changed that community environment, it's thriving. So that group increased their microbial diversity. Quite a bit of it was not from the foods that they were eating, but just from the environment as a whole. And we measured 90 different inflammatory markers in their blood and 20 of them went down. So if a couple of them went down, that would have been one thing. But 20 of the 90 went down. That was the strongest signal we got. And inflammation itself is very challenging because there's a lot of inflammatory markers out there. As I'm sure you and your listeners know, you can't go to your doc right now and say, hey, doc, I want to know what my immune function number is. Give me my inflammatory number. Am I a 20 or am I a 50? (laughs) So... That hasn't yet moved into the clinical realm, so we all agree that inflammation underlies much of chronic degenerative disease, but that we don't know which inflammatory markers to measure or which subset. So we're stuck measuring something like 90 and seeing how many go down. So 90 went down. The group that doubled their fiber, we really had expected to see a lowering of inflammation in them, and there wasn't one. This is a relatively small study. There's 18 people doing fiber and 18 people doing fermented food, but the Sonnenbergs did a masterful job of interpreting this by sort of splitting up the 18 in groups of six that had the highest microbial diversity and the lowest and in the middle. And what they found was that people who had the lowest microbial diversity actually saw a negative in, in, uh, rise, increase in inflammation Uh, Mm. when we put all that fiber down their gullet and their interpretation was, this is, this has to be taken very loosely is like a fire hose of fiber coming into the gut with not enough microbes to break it up. Because Mm. when they looked at the people with high microbial diversity, they did well, but the high and the low canceled one another. One inflammatory situation got worse and one got better. 
And it looked like nothing happened until they teased them apart. We have a current study going on with 130 pregnant women where we gave them high fiber, high fermented, or both. Because one of our hypotheses is what if you gave them fermented food, increase their microbial diversity mm. so that they could then handle the higher fiber that's coming down. So that's mm. what we're looking at next. And we're tracking these women, the transfer of the maternal microbiome to the infant. We have 124 babies born already. And so we're going to see what happens in terms of the mom sort of optimizing their microbiome and transferring it to the kids. So that's, that's some of the stuff we're doing with microbes. And you're looking at the babies um, three months, six months, nine months, up to 18 months after birth. Is that, is that? And the donor, this is actually a donor funded study. She just asked us to follow the kids till they're five. So yes, the original study is to follow them till they're 18 months old. And uh, we won't know that for 18 more months because the last baby was just born uh, a couple of weeks ago. We started with 135 women. Tell me if you think this sounds impressive. I thought we'd have miscarriages and nauseated women. And I thought, oh my God, I've never worked with pregnant women. How many will finish? 124 out of 135 finished the study. So we don't have the data yet, but we have this incredibly rich data set and picture some had C-sections and some had vaginal, some are breastfeeding and some are not, some got gestational diabetes and some didn't. So there are actually going to be a number of factors to pull into here. So it'll largely be an exploratory study, but the microbiome is fascinating. We do have some women getting C-sections that are, you know, swabbing some cloth and vaginal juices, worried that the C-section prevented the transmission. I was going to ask that. And they put it in the baby's mouth, right? Like from the vagina straight in their mouth so that they get like, it's like they went through the canal. I don't think we have enough, but we'll have some C-section women that did that and some C-section women that did not do that. So there's just a lot of really fun questions that remain to be answered there too. And you, and you haven't seen anything yet that you can share? Little, any no, tidbits, so nothing. like it's all, all the stuff has been sent out to the lab for the very first paper of the moms. Ah. This will be coming out for years to come. 